Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode number 90 of the Haskin Cast podcast. If you are joining me when this episode is being released, Happy New Year! If you are joining me after this episode has been released, well, still Happy New Year. I am very excited to bring on uh, this week's guest. I've wanted to uh, find some time to get him on the show for a while, and it finally worked out, and I uh, did a walkthrough of his newest uh, sound library, Industrial Metal, which is heavy percussion and uh, some really interesting metallic sounds and, and drums and explosions and sort of things. And uh, that walkthrough, which is on YouTube, is down in the show notes, and uh, and also the link to where you can check out and purchase this new product. It is absolutely fantastic. Uh, I could see getting a lot of use out of this library. And uh, I talk about some of the things I really like about it in the demo. And also uh, Rick and I will get into that in a little bit. And we're also going to talk about his life, uh, just recording things and shaping sounds and uh, capturing things that uh, I've never understood how you capture them. And a lot of them you get one chance, like breaking a giant pane of glass. You get one chance to record that. Uh, a jet fly by, not the easiest thing to capture. Uh, but Rick is a master of those things. And we'll be talking all about uh, that while, uh, while he's on with me. And I'm really, really grateful to find uh, some time to sit down with him. So it's a new year and, uh, you know, I'm not one of those people that looks at life and goes, I expect my life to change on this arbitrary date or because this uh, time has passed from this second to that second. I'm the kind of guy that like, if I don't like something, I just change it. I don't wait. Uh, like when I quit smoking in, I want to say it was September of 2013. The day I quit smoking, I had no intention to quit smoking. I was not a heavy smoker. Most days, uh, I smoked less than a quarter of a pack. But uh, I had taken a friend out to dinner for her birthday and uh, took her home, went back to my place. I was out on the patio uh, smoking a cigarette. And I said, uh, I don't want to do this anymore. And I took another puff. And I'm like, yeah, I really don't want to do this anymore. And I put it out. And that was that. Now, I'm not saying that I haven't had cravings over the years. I certainly have, especially at trigger points like a big meal or uh, it used to be when I used to drive uh, a long distance, there were certain points that I would designate as a, a point to light up and kind of, you know, help pass the time and 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 that. But it it wouldn't have happened if I didn't just want to do it right in that moment. So I, I'm not a fan of saying, you know, as of this date, I'm going to do something because I may not be ready to do that thing. But that's just me. For some people, I know that having a uh, specific stopping point will help them uh, mentally work up towards it and uh, and then and then conquer it because that's when they've uh, geared up. They've, they've done you know whatever they've needed to do to climb the ladder to reach that uh, part of the wall in their life. So it, to each his own, but I would love to hear uh, what you guys want to accomplish in 2020 and uh, going forward, because again, you know, uh, I, I don't necessarily think it needs to be confined to that 365 day period. Some things you'll do sooner than you thought, some things you'll do later than you thought, uh, but it's all going to work out. And that's the most important thing. So I would love to hear from you guys. Give me a, a shout at scott at scotthaskin.com or uh, on my Facebook group for the Haskin Cast podcast, uh, Twitter at mental or at uh, Scott Haskin 31. Uh, you can find me on Instagram at mental sauna. And I think I also have a second um, uh, Twitter at mental sauna. I really need to get back on to Twitter more <laughs> right now. Like lately, the only reason I've gotten on is to interact with uh, Nathan and John at the deep purple podcast, because they're constantly just posting really cool stuff about, you know, the bands and, and different interviews that they've done and, or, or not interviews, but uh, different shows that they've done. Like they just, uh, <laughs> the last one was just on David Coverdale tweets, which I thought was absolutely hilarious. I, I've been a big fan of David Coverdale since I was a kid, but I, what I really love about him now, uh, more so than, than, you know, beyond the songwriting and performances and, and great vocals and that is just his attitude towards life. Like everything he looks at is like childlike excitement and wonder and joking and jovial. And he just seems so high spirited all the time. Now, granted, this is social media. So we all know how easy it is to make it look 
like you feel that way when you don't necessarily feel that way. But uh, either way, he's putting out a lot of great content. It keeps me laughing. They picked out some absolutely hilarious quotes from Twitter. But here's the interesting thing. Now, apparently he has different strategies. So on Twitter, he's jokey and jovial and childlike and and very uh, horny. And then on Instagram, he's like uh, almost reflective, like, this is my driveway and this is my home and uh, this is where I like to lounge around and here's where I like to drink uh, wine. Very um, more of his personality and, and his lifestyle comes out, whereas more of the childlike jovial side comes out on Twitter. Um, I don't know if he has any other sites where he's even different from that, but uh, it's really interesting now that they uh, they brought that up on the Deep Purple podcast. Uh, I've really noticed that in, in the last day. So it's uh, fascinating to see the different strategies. I don't know if that was his. I don't know if that was his publicist. But either way, you get a real sense of the fact that he really grasps and appreciates life. And I see so many people just complaining all the time and this doesn't work and that doesn't work and I'm unhappy. And, you know, it's it's all about your attitude. It's all about what you embrace and what you uh, want your life to be. If you're unhappy, make a change. You don't need to wait for any certain time period. Uh, the other thing that I've noticed over the years with resolutions is that it seems like if something doesn't work, um, let's take a diet because that's, that's a pretty common um, New Year's resolution. So uh, somebody goes on a diet. And of course, you know, right after the holidays, you're still thinking in the in the mentality of all the holiday snacks and pies and cakes. You've probably got some leftover chocolate or whatever from the holidays. So maybe not the best time to start a diet, maybe wean into it a little bit as you kind of get all those things out of your world. But what happens is, or what seems to happen to so many people is they'll go on a diet and then they'll have, uh, you know, friends come over, they have one more last hurrah, it's somebody's birthday, whatever, and they, and they have like a binge night. And then they go back online the next day and they're like, well, that diet didn't work. And, and so I guess that didn't happen. And it's not necessarily that the diet doesn't work. It's the uh, circumstances. But here's my thing. Life is not pass or fail, right? Like if you have your diet and you have a binge night, that's fine. What you can do is you can just get back up on the horse the next day. It's not about being perfect all the time. It's about how long you can be consistent. So I encourage anybody who's starting anything new, who's quitting anything that they don't like, uh, you know, it's okay to be human. It's okay to make a mistake. It's okay to take a step backwards. Uh, what doesn't work is if you just get off the game board and don't uh, work towards that goal because not everything is going to work perfectly every day. Be human. Keep at it. Keep fighting for what you want your life to be. So that's my little uh, New Year's rant. I can't remember. I don't think I, well, my show didn't appear on New Year's Day last year. I don't think so. I don't think I did anything uh, New Year's rant wise. But anyway, that's my rant. Just keep at it. Harsh, I know. So uh, I've got a lot of great things lined up for 2020 for the Haskin Cast podcast. Uh, I'm I'm not going to really release any information until uh, you know things are at that point where I've recorded the interview or uh, you know it's it's definitely been confirmed. Probably after I've recorded it because you know even after you've confirmed it, sometimes things happen. Guests uh, can't make it. Something comes up. They have to drop out. Uh, whatever. So, but but I can say that I've lined up a lot of great things for this year. I'm very excited. Uh, this is the third year now of the Haskin Cast podcast. Of course, I started it um, really a, a less than a year and a half ago, but it was before uh, New Year's. So this is going into the third year. 90 episodes, man. It's it's uh, it been a great haul. And uh, we're, we're getting close to that first major milestone of the three milestones that this podcast should hit at episode 100. And I'm very excited about the uh, guests that I have coming on, but again, have not yet taped the interview. So uh, I'm going to uh, save this one as a surprise because it's uh, very special to me to uh, be able to sit down with this person and talk to them about the extraordinary things that they've done with their life. And uh, it's it's definitely going to be one to listen to. But in the meantime, there's all the other podcasts to listen to uh, that I've done, uh, the other 89, uh, as well as everything in between. And if you're looking for some other podcasts, there's a lot of great stuff out there. I mentioned uh, John and Nathan at the Deep Purple Podcast, which is not only the only Deep Purple Podcast, it is the best only Deep Purple Podcast. I really enjoy it. I just listen to uh, enjoy listening to the those guys chat. Uh, they're a lot of fun. They're, uh, they're 
even when they're not knowledgeable, like they're honest about it, which I really like. They give great opinions. They don't, uh, they're not trying to impress anybody. They're just, uh, they feel what they feel and they think what they think. And uh, I really like that. And I love their voting system, whether it be hats or fireballs or whatever uh, they use to rate their songs, depending on the album that they're reviewing. But honestly, I never thought I would listen to an hour of David Coverdale tweets. That was just hilarious. Um, my friends, uh, I was a guest on um, on the Levity Show, Brandon and Brendan over there doing a great job. They're uh, they're uh, catching up to ten episodes, doing great. Um, really, really appreciate young people that are passionate about what they're doing, being comedians. Uh, Brandon's just released uh, another song under Raspy God is his name, and go check him out on iTunes. Uh, really, really digging his his work, and it's not even a genre that I enjoy that much. But uh, but really like the stuff that he's doing. It's very intelligent, uh, very different from the kind of stuff that I've heard before uh, in the hip hop world. So go check that out. Uh, if you're into The Office, Jenna Fisher and Angela Kinsey uh, have the office of uh, the Office Ladies podcast, which is very very good. And um, you know, there's another podcast that I didn't know about, and uh, and I binged every episode of it in a day because I think there's only a handful so far. Uh, my friend Sarah has uh, the Baton Twirlers podcast, and you know, here's here's the thing, and this is one of the things that I really like doing with this show is talking to people that are doing things that are behind the scenes that make things happen or that you don't necessarily think about. And listening to you know the life of a baton twirler, there is so much involved so much exercise and dedication and and things. And I just, right before she and I were talking about it and, and I started listening to it, uh, I randomly saw this video on YouTube about a day in the life of a rocket. And I don't know why I watched it. Something was just like, you should check this out and, and really appreciate, you know, what goes into this. And she talked about her, you know, how she works out, how she, you know, does the uh, the extensive work on her hair and makeup and the outfits and, you know, everything just to be at the point where you get on stage and then you're performing in front of 6,000 people. Uh, it's high pressure because the expectations uh, historically of the Rockettes have always been like world-class top notch. And these are all these people that have to, um, you know, work together to stay in sync. And it, they always put on very, very impressive shows. And, you know, when you, when you hear all the stuff that goes into it, you really just gain a whole new appreciation for the art. Even if it's something that you're not necessarily into, you can gain appreciation for the amount of effort that goes into making it a thing. And I really enjoyed that. Uh, and so uh, check out the Baton Twirlers podcast. I was listening to it on, I think on uh, Apple podcasts, if I'm not mistaken, uh, but it's, it's definitely there. And I think it might, it might have been on Podbean, but I'm pretty sure it was uh, Apple Podcasts that I was listening to. And you can get all those on Apple Podcasts, all the podcasts that I just mentioned. Uh, some of them are on Podbean as well. But listen, wherever you uh, connect with podcasts uh, or here, wherever you're connecting with this podcast. But thank you guys. Welcome to 2020. Uh, I'm excited to talk to Rick. And uh, if you want to, you can pause the recording and watch the walkthrough. Or, uh, you know, to get kind of a sense of what we're talking about, or you can uh, listen to what we're talking about and then go do the walkthrough. I also did a demo song featuring uh, this particular uh, sound library, which I've also linked to from my SoundCloud. So you can check that out in the show notes. Hopefully I'll remember to never delete that from SoundCloud. And if I do, just send me an email and, uh, and I'll send it to you. So thank you guys. Let's, uh, let's get right into the interview and let's talk to Rick. So I'm going to punch in a little editor's note here. Here is the genius of me as we uh, climb into 2020. Uh, while I was editing the episode, I realized I could just play the song right here instead of my usual uh, segue into the interview from this segment. Uh, why don't I just play the song that I wrote that demos the product? So here it is.
All right, ladies and gentlemen, hopefully you've had an opportunity to check out the demo I did for my friend Rick Allen's new sound library, Industrial Metal, which if you didn't get the gist of it, I love it. I think it's fantastic. And here to talk about that and everything else that has ever happened since the beginning of time is my buddy Rick Allen. Rick, how are you today? Scott, I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing great, man. Thanks so much for taking some time out of your crazy glass breaking schedule to uh, to come and record. <laughs> My wife threw me out of all my Foley stages and said, for the holidays, you better be quiet. So I, you know, I had to do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's got to be tough for her. I mean, uh, the sound of, between the explosions and the drum hits and the glass breaking, that's, uh, that's a tough life to sign up for. She has actually, in several instances when we've been out in the field, she's been a good assistant. But um, I'll, I'll start out with one fun story, if you don't mind. And sure. it has to do with recording explosions. We were at a 4th of July event that involved some uh, ex-Navy um, SEALs on about 60 acres of property in northern Arizona. Mm -hmm. And these guys discovered that the circumference of the inside of an acetylene uh, gas tank for acetylene torches, the inside dimensions of those tanks just happened to be the same size as a bowling ball. <laughs> so they uh, they they cut the, the uh, uh, acetylene tank in half and welded on some feet so it would could point it in a little bit of an angle and threw some black uh, powder in the bottom of it along with a baggie of diesel fuel and uh, then dropped a bowling ball in it and lit a fuse. So we, we, uh, we at, you know, it was a party. So we wanted to make sure that everybody knew that we were recording it. Cause you know, the first thing you want to do usually when you see something like that is uh, in normal circumstance would be like, Ooh, ah, that kind of thing, or, mm. or more explicit <laughs> replies. But, uh, so we, we told everybody, Hey, listen, we're going to do this two or three times. Uh, but just for one of the times, just suck it up and don't make any noise. Cause we're going to be recording. And so everybody said, okay. So, uh, Tammy, my wife, it got everybody quiet and we're ready. And the, the explosion happened, the bowling ball shot up in the air, and one of the dogs of one of the folks went running after the bowling ball when it was like 600 feet in the air. Oh. And so T Tammy let out a huge F-bomb. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then turned to me, and I looked at her, and and, and she just started crying. Like, I've oh. ruined it. Oh, you know, and, and, I, and I told her, don't worry about it. And even better, new technology, uh, Isotope RX-7. Uh, That's took right. Took care of, yeah, she, it was it was in a place where I, I got rid of it, no problem, and it, everything worked out just fine. But it was it was one of those experiences of it, you, you just don't realize when you're recording a lot of this stuff, how much background noise there is, even if it's in a quiet situation and you've even made sure that it is that way. Oh, sure. Well, even, even the slightest breeze can make a big difference in the recording. Oh yeah, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So well, I, 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 I start that with a, with a, with a, uh, a story about my wife that's going to get me in trouble when she hears the podcast. So <laughs> it's 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 all uphill from here. <laughs> well, yeah, and and I love that you started the show with a bang, both literally and physically. Uh, oh. <laughs> well, you know, but that's uh that that is a tough thing because field recording you're dealing with so many just random potential factors. I mean, a bird could have flown and cawed, or you know, a, a lion could have made a sound, or I mean, anything that's out there in nature could have ruined that recording, and you had literally one chance to get that. Well, I actually have a a, a, a screenshot of um, spectrum analysis of a explosion that I recorded at a fireworks show. Um, it actually wasn't a show; we were setting off fireworks out in out in some uh, field area, mm -hmm. and it was an it was a beautiful explosion, followed by a very unexpectedly scared cricket <laughs> going. Chirp, 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 chirp. And the screenshot is amazing. It looks like a hi-hat pattern. You can see the frequency and the dashes um, just go across the screen. And years ago, that would have absolutely just ruined the entire take and you would have had to start all over again. Or you would have spent an hour trying to do some niche uh, EQing and and notching it out and, and all sorts of other stuff like that. It would have been difficult. Um, the beauty of the new technology, the things that we have our hands on now is, bam, I just... Um, I just drew a little circle around that on the in in uh, in RX and hit heal and it went away. Yeah, that is really one of the greatest tools I think is available to us these days. That has become a staple just with the things I do. But you live much more in a recording, uh, live sound recording than I do, and uh, I can't even imagine how much time you spend on that versus actually recording things. It 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 is it has changed 
the, the balance of, of where you spend a lot of your time. Although I'm still a big believer in quality recording, mm-hmm. you know, the, the, you know, fixing it in the mix, it, it, you know, the old philosophy of that. I, I, I love the fact that it's possible, but I avoid it as much as I can with a little bit of pre-planning and, uh, and luck. Um, it, you can, you can create some great sounds without having to, to dive too deeply into fixing it. But what I love is just taking out noise floor and just cleaning things up and making, making the sounds uh, really pristine. Well, even just taking up the ambiance of the area, whether, you know, you're in a gymnasium or you're outdoors with the crickets, it's just being able to get it down to just the sound that you wanted to record. That's a vital tool even for that. Uh, And it can save some instances too. I I was out at uh, Luke Air Force Base recording some F-35 passbys um, and uh, um, the problem there was, and you mentioned it earlier, wind. And then also when you add not only the wind into it, but but the volume, uh, uh, literal amplitude of, of the of the jets flying by, um, even with the best choice of mics and not getting distortion, the air actually, I mean, physically, even if you're not listening and re- capturing with a microphone, the air actually is uh, vibrated enough by the by the, the the jets going by that the sound you get that crunchy sound, um, and uh, um, a, a buddy of mine who is the sound effects editor for the TV show SEAL Team uh, on CBS. He called me up and goes, hey, you got any F- F-35s? And, and I, I went, yeah, I just, I grabbed those the other day and I hadn't mastered them yet. And I listened to them and they were a little crunchy in my, you know, to for my field. We were able to go in with RX uh, and um, de, uh, de-distort them, so to speak, where we backed off on that, on that crunchiness to the point where it sounded very comfortable. Um, and it's, it saved, it saved those sound effects. It's, and, uh, which was, uh, you know, that would not have been possible without a lot of EQ and, and working on it for a long time, uh, years ago. Right. Because even if the recording is distorted, the actual sound in most cases is still buried in there. If you can unravel it. Yes. Yep. And I think in the old days, we would have just thrown that recording away because we didn't have the ability to unravel. It was just, that's what we got. It's distorted. You can't use it for anything. Dump it and redo it. Yep, absolutely. Uh, but I mean, it's, it's funny. As as much as I say that, it is a a stop. You know, it's, it's, it's an emergency ability to fix that. I would much rather um, have someone learn microphone technique, learn recording technique. I mean, the education and the knowledge... Uh, in this business, I think is more important than ever because the technology is available to everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so it's, I, I liken it back to the days when I'm going to show my age here, but when, when we first started having computers and word processors instead of typewriters, mm-hmm. um, you know, everybody thought, Ooh, now I can become a famous author. I can become Stephen <laughs> King or whatever. Right, you know? Yeah. But, and it's like, no, the technology made it, it makes it easier to take the creativity and finish it but it doesn't make you creative. That's so right. you, I, I'm a big, big believer uh, in in learning and, and audio education and figuring out how the equipment works, taking the time to learn what a plugin does uh, so that, so that you can, my, my favorite, my favorite thought process is I want to learn all the rules so that I can go break them at the appropriate time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds like something you would say. But yeah. <laughs> don't but but in a way it's even worse now than the word processing times because now you're given all these templates that people just think, well, I'll just put pull up this template because it says rock guitar and and that'll solve all my problems and I don't need to learn what tweaking is and how to really dial in a sound. I I'm using this as my final instead of my stepping stone. I couldn't agree more. In fact, when I first started in the sound design business, it wasn't even referred to as sound design at that point in time. Um, and it was, I, I, I entered in the, in the synthesizer realm. Um, mm-hmm. my first synthesizer was a ARP Odyssey and, um, and I think learning on the old analog synthesizers gave me a little bit of a, uh, a foot up on a lot of people that are trying to crank out sounds now because of the fact that I know what an oscillator does when it goes into mm-hmm. uh, a, a filt- voltage controlled filter into an amplifier. And I know what I'm doing if I want to tweak something. And I, and I, I, a lot of, um, a lot of people now just go to a preset, which is, which is okay. Um, but 
I personally like to put a personal touch and be able to massage something into the mix and get it so it, it really, really works. And we have so many tools to do that, but we're all in such a hurry just to make a sound sometimes that uh, we don't learn the instrument. I agree. And, and I said on the show many times, I feel very strongly about the fact that because of the way that we're utilizing technology now, especially with that sort of grab and go mentality, is that the production on everything just sounds the same. It doesn't have an individual personality. Whereas you look back at albums from the 70s and every album from the same band had its own distinct personality. It it did. And yet I, I don't want to, I mean, I'm, I'm torn between I, it, I'm definitely not that old man who says get off my lawn. <laughs> you know, it's like back, <laughs> back back in my days we compressed tracks uphill in the snow. You know, right? Yeah. Like that, yeah. Um, but at the same time, lo- knowing what compression is, knowing what uh, distortion is, and if you learn what these things are, you can understand that if you're messing with the release time or the attack time on a compressor, why you're doing that instead right. of just you know randomly doing that, or uh, you know. A, a setting, I mean, isotopes, a good example, uh, and waves too, but their, their presets are, are pretty solid mm-hmm. yet at the same time, just because it says kick drum, um, you might be, you might be using an entirely different sounding kick drum than that, that preset was based on. Uh, and, and wouldn't you like to be able to customize it to exactly fit what you want to do? Uh, and that's, and you can't do that without learning. Right. Well, if you're using like a, a punchy Dave Weckl kick versus a boomy John Bonham kick, that plugin is going to work or that setting is going to work completely differently. And if you yep. don't know how to take that tool and shape it to get the ultimate sound that you want, or maybe you don't even know the sound that you want, but just to know what to move to play around with it, to, to shape it differently, uh, that makes a big difference because I think that we're just, this is my processing chain. This is the Shep's chain. This is you know, what I use or what was suggested that I used without delving into that. But here's what I'm using it with. Yes. And there's still times where I'll, if I'm in a hurry and you're hitting a deadline, um, you know, these, these one knob plugins, they, they speed things up yeah. and they work. But if I have the time to really dive in, if I, if I'm doing something that is going to be a long-term sound, something that's going to go in something that I'm releasing or something that's going to go in a movie trailer, I'll absolutely spend the time to, to customize every layer and get it, get it to its, to its best sound. Absolutely. And that's the thing is that there are times when you can just plug it in and go. Uh, there's times when you can just tweak it a little bit and go, because you're right. They are designed very, very well. Uh, it just seems to me that the education of it, at least with the people, a lot of the people that I interact with, they just immediately talk about the preset they use and they don't talk about the tweaks or, you know, here's what I did to add a little bit of my own sound or here's how I find my own sound. It's just, here's what I got. So I'm going with it because I want to hurry up and release this. Well, and, and, and one of the things I like about, um, being at this part in this point in my career, uh, is that I'm able to associate with cool people like you. I mean, it's, I'm, well, I'm able to you. hang around. Yeah. I'm able to hang around people that I respect. And I, I mean, dude, I, I, I am now the, I mean, this, this sounds scary because I don't, you know, it, it, let, I'm, I'm thinking of the average age of your, your podcast, uh, experiencer, but I'm now entering my 45th year of earning a paycheck in professional audio. That's awesome. And yeah. And so, I mean, so, so literally, uh, you know, Yes, I have cut the tip of, of one of my fingers, uh, sliced off a little piece of it by uh, working on analog tape with a razor blade. And, you know, <laughs> oh, the good so, days. I mean, so, yeah, so I've got I've got stories to tell, but at the same time, um, I'm I'm also learning every day uh, of of something new. I, I I think the technology is amazing and, and coming along really well, but the education. I just wish there were more mentors out there. Um, or, or that people would take the time to, to explore, uh, finding, finding that information. That's one of the things I love about your podcast. And and what I love about, uh, the whole podcast world is there is a, an opportunity to listen and, and grasp new technology and new ideas and that sort of thing. And I'm still doing it. I mean, uh, it, uh, uh, well, in fact, actually a couple of years ago, I was invited to, um, be a guest speaker uh, for a night meeting of the AES, the student AES group at the Conservatory of Recording Arts and Sciences here in town. And um, I, I went and I talked about sound design. I had 
such an amazing time. Uh, we started at seven o'clock at night. It was supposed to end at nine. We were still, uh, a couple of the students were asking me questions at 1130 at night and we just had to kind of pull, pull the plug on it. It was, it was so much fun. And it, what it did was I ended up um, having such a fun time that I asked, uh, I wanted to kind of expand my, my experience in life. And so I asked if there was any uh, part-time uh, instructor work that I could take on. And uh, so for two years, uh, you know, a day a week or so, I'm going down there to a, a facility that also then expands my world because the students, they know everything. I mean, it's to me, it's amazing. Um, I'm learning so much from them as much as I'm teaching them. And the facility is 13 uh, just incredible studios with, S you know, there's a couple of SSLs, a couple of API consoles, huge live rooms, um, you know, just incredible outboard gear. And I love working with the other instructors because we share information with each other and, and that sort of thing. So I, as much as I enjoy teaching, uh, I'm learning and it's, it's keeping me excited and fresh. So that's something that, um, uh, that I'm a, a true, I mean, I absolutely believe in mentoring, uh, and passing along some, some of the information. And I know some people that get a little paranoid in this business because it is a rough business. You know, that's like, I'm not going to tell you my, my settings on my compressor. I'm not going to tell you, <laughs> you know, that's, yeah. you know, what, what I did on the, you know, the Moog or whatever. And it's like, ah, my philosophy. And I, and I, so far, so far it hasn't bankrupted me and I hope it never does. I mean, it's not, hasn't taken money out of my pocket, but I'm, I'm a true believer in, you know, Hey, uh, there's enough work for everybody to go around for the good guys. And so if, if I can teach you something and you take it and make it your own, fine. I, I'm not, I, I, at least so far, I haven't been scared of it. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, yeah. You, you may find me in another year going, I'm not telling you anything, <laughs> but, uh, but for now I just, I like that creative synergy. I mean, kind of the same philosophy of recording music, um, when you think about it, it's like, you know, back in, back in the quote old days when it was, everybody went to the studio, there was a bass player, there was a drummer, there was a, a keyboard player. Um, and people would share ideas when they're working on a tune. It was like, you know, the bass player might go, Hey, let me try this. And we've, we've got to guard ourselves against locking ourselves in our studio mm -hmm. and do, and whereas we can do everything ourselves and I don't have anything against that, but we can get, um, we can get, a, a little, you know, we can have our blinders on and we can't all be experts at everything. So I always like trying to share things with people. And that's one of the things, um, you know, case in point on the uh, industrial metal contact instrument. I just have to thank so many of the beta testers because we got a lot of feedback and there was some stuff like, well, should it do this? Can it do this? And that sort of thing. I, you found a couple of, uh, of, of things that you suggested, can it, you know, can you change this? And we recoded it and, mm. and that sort of thing. So I'm, I, I, my ego, one of the things that I'm a true believer in is, is, um, I, I don't have an ego because I really don't think I'm that smart. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's just really nice being, hanging around other people that have the, uh, the, the creative abilities and stuff. I mean, it's, it's a good, it's good to put it all in the soup and, and let it all cook. Well, I, there's, there's a couple of really interesting points that you brought up. And the first one being that your you're willing to know that there's still a lot you can learn. I mean, you've been doing this for 45 years at just as a professional. I mean, that doesn't count the the amateur years, but the fact that you're still saying there's still more I can learn that I don't know everything, even after all this time growing with the technology as it's grown over the years, that is a huge testament to why I think you're as successful as you are, because I think most people read the headline and they think they know the article and then they just move forward, assuming that they've got it. Right. No. Yep. Yeah. And, and, it, and it's, it's more, I, I actually like being proved wrong when I'm, I, uh, one of my classes that I teach is Foley, which is syncing sound effects to, uh, to video. And we were doing a, a scene where there was um, a vampire turns into a bat and flies away. And I've always used for that is, is uh, I love, coming up with different props, but I've always used uh, an umbrella to, uh, to, to move. And, and it kind of creates the wind flapping of the wings. And, um, a, one of the students, uh, she goes, I've got an idea. Can I try something? And I was just, I was, I was in a, a mood where I was a little bit in a hurry, but something inside of me went, come on, you know, it's an idea. Let's see what happens. And she, uh, she pulled out a couple of, uh, pieces of tissue paper and got really close to a shotgun microphone with that proximity effect and just flapped the tissue paper around. It sounded awesome. 
it was an incredible layer to the whole thing. And we, and if, if you would have kind of just, if I thought that, you know, nobody else knows what they're doing except for me, we would, I, I would have missed an incredible opportunity to find out and try something new. Um, Absolutely. So, yeah. Um, so it's just, it's a matter, I mean, yes, it is a matter of how much time you have if you're working on a project. Is it, are there deadlines looming and that sort of thing? Cause that, and then getting back to the preset thing. I mean, there are times when presets can save your rear end because you have to get something done quickly, but yeah. f for clients, for clients that understand uh, the need to take time, you know, creativity takes time. <laughs> it's, it, it, that's the only thing, you know, that is a fact. And so for when you have a client that understands that, take advantage of that. Um, you know, not all clients will, but, um, but it's a beautiful thing when you do have a client that goes, no, I want it to be the best it can be. Take your time to do it. Well, absolutely. And it's that kind of experimentation that really teaches you or gives you the opportunity to arrive at new and inventive ways of doing things. But I'm guessing that you had to go this route because you had not had the chance to sample a real vampire turning back into a bat. Well, I, I had it scheduled, but then, <laughs> then, then, then everything just sucked. So, uh, <laughs> Oh, what a bloody mess. Yeah, uh, yeah. But I love that. You know, and I remember years ago, there was a parody of Star Wars. And I think I, I want to say this was like the early 80s when cable first came to, to Michigan. Uh, there was a parody of Star Wars called Hardware Wars, where everything was done with sort of kitchen utensils. And there was a split screen version of it where you saw the guys creating the sounds that they were using in the video to like syncing it to the video. And I learned so much. And I was I was probably maybe 10 or 11 years old back then. But I started to have an appreciation for this back then because I got to see the the actuality of how it all was put together. Of course, spaceships don't make that sound. That's like eight or nine sounds layered together for a laser in Star Wars. You When you really get to see it from that scope, how can you not go, this is an incredibly creative job? Oh, it, it's to me, it's it's fascinating. I mean, w uh, I went out and we recorded a bunch of uh, AR-15 gunshots for uh, for a project. And to get that hyper real sound, to get that Hollywood sound, I mean, a, a gunshot, you know, it's 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 loud, but it's it, sometimes if it's brought down to a normal level, it actually comes across like a kernel of popcorn popping. Uh, it's not that exciting. But when you get the, when you adjust the attack and the release of all the reflections and all that sort of thing. But on top of that, there's times where I've added uh, a kick drum and a snare underneath the, uh, the gunshot for layering to just make it bigger than life. Uh, and, and so it's, it's our job as a sound designer, in my opinion, is to create either direct attention of a viewer if they're watching something or to create an emotion. Uh, and, and that, that means there are no rules. Uh, you know, it means whatever sounds right, sounds right. Uh, so don't let anybody tell you, well, that's not, that's not going to work. Cause that's not what it is. Uh, one of the, one of the uh, people I've, I, I know works on the show, uh, Atlanta, um, and does a lot of the gunshot fully. And they, most of the gun handling sounds in that show are actually done with a three hole punch and a can opener. Really? So, yeah. Yeah. So it's like, don't, you know, it, it, Things that you think you're hearing, um, it's our job to convince you that it's more exciting than it is or more dramatic than it is or more emotional than it is. Uh, but we, you, you, you're not locked into using um, w the real thing. Uh, it, it, and, you know, the AR-15 is a good example of that. If you watched most TV shows or movies with, with an automatic weapon and all the soldiers moving it around, you hear the gun rattle and, and all that sort of thing. Well, in real life, <laughs> if your AR-15 makes a rattling sound as you're moving it, you probably ought to go back off the battlefield and fix your gun right. because they're not supposed to rattle. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but but yeah, Hollywood has kind of changed our perception. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, you know, it's it's interesting because it, there's a lot of things I could forgive sound-wise. If, if the gun didn't pop as loud uh, as you would expect it to in Hollywood, I could forgive that a lot more than I could forgive something being out of sync. <laughs> there Absolutely. is nothing more annoying to me than trying to watch a video that, you know, maybe wasn't compressed properly or something. And the audio gets off the track of the video 
And it, it just, I can't, I, it's unwatchable to me at that point. It's not only important to get the sound precise, but the timing of it, especially when you're doing machine gun fire, that's a more challenging thing than say popping open a bottle of champagne. Well, and there's really no excuse in today's world. I mean, working with Pro Tools. In the old days, they literally would record on optical magnetic tape, optical or magnetic tape, but it was it was um, sprocketed. I mean, it, it, it had film sprockets, mm -hmm. and they would actually have to align certain effects and that sort of thing. If they did ADR, they'd have to move. But if you wanted to resync something, somebody would literally have to pull that uh, those sprockets and move them a couple of sprockets and that sort of thing. Uh, it took a lot of effort and a lot of time. Now with Pro Tools, I mean, you hit the the comma or the or the period button to nudge something in in time code mode, and you can be subframe accurate. So there is, if you if if you care about your project, there is no excuse for that, and it is distracting. You're absolutely right. It pulls you out. I mean, for me, it pulls me out of the immersion of the, of the excitement completely as a professional, but it, it, you, you ask anybody where they've done a bad job of ADR or dialogue replacement in a TV show and any typical viewer, if sees that it, you know, we've heard and watched lips move and heard how it, uh, you know, hits our brain since we were born. Right. So, so to have that not be right, we notice that. And so that, that is one thing <laughs> I always laugh that when it comes to post-production or sound effects design in a film or a TV show, the only time we're appreciated, or I shouldn't even say appreciated, the only time we're noticed <laughs> is when we don't do our job correctly. Oh yeah. Because if, if, if we do our job correctly, you might think that, that all those sounds, all those footsteps were done by the actor out in the field. Nope. <laughs> that, that's, that's some goofball like me in, you know, you never know that, that, that sexy girl walking in the fishnet stockings and the short, short skirt and the six inch spiked heels down the sidewalk. Um, those clicks of her heels probably were, <laughs> was, was a, was a person, uh, you know, hairy old guy wearing oversized high heeled shirt uh, <laughs> right. so, yeah. uh, shoes in a, in a Foley stage, you know? Right. So well, you gave yeah. her my number though, right? <laughs> well, but but there are times too. You're going to continue design. to get me in trouble. You can continue to get me in trouble with my wife. Yes. <laughs> I'll I'll have a talk with her when this is. I over. am now permanently locking myself in, out here in the studio. So I'm, not, I'm not I'm not going home. <laughs> well, you were needing to get away to Vegas for a couple of days, weren't you? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, there are times though when I think sound design is used creatively as a subtext, and one of the the things that pops into my head is Rocky Three. You know, they were using the uh, I. The Tiger is the theme song to uh, to Rocky's point of view. But when they showed Clubber Lang, when he was about to attack, when he was just ready to strike, they had that lion's growl that they mixed with his voice. And that really brought out an element that I think from a creative standpoint, I don't think I would have come up with that, but I love that they did that. Well, it, it, that just reminds me of a story too, of how you can... Um you can add to things. Uh, the if you go back and they're re you know they're they're re-releasing the the new Top Gun, but if you go back to the original Top Gun, um, the the sound designer in that she actually liked the sound of the jet flybys, mm -hmm. but didn't didn't think it quite had enough emotion to it. Go back and listen to that, watch that, and you'll actually hear something under the jet flybys that'll surprise you. But once you know what it is, you'll hear it, and that is lion and tiger roars. Interesting. Um, there, there are actually animal roars underneath those jet flybys that add that texture to it, that adds some excitement to it. And, and that's, that, to me, that's something that um, I think about a lot. And that is, I, I entered this business with synthesis, but the more I got into it, I've kind of expanded over the years into organic sounds and adding those in. And even if you're transforming them and manipulating them and changing them all up, I like the fact that the brain and and this is just no scientific uh, proof of this at all. This is my this is my theory, but I think the brain recognizes even a massively manipulated sound and says, "Ah, okay, that was a dog bark or whatever," you know. Mm -hmm. And so the brain feels comfortable with it and opens up its you know it, it kind of then opens up the ears that way. Um, and so use I, I I very much lately have been enjoying using. Uh, a lot of organic sounds. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I did not know that about Top Gun, but I think it also plays on another level too, that sort of primal subtext that 
uh, man's quest for power and control and that animalistic uh, intensity that we have in us to have those things. I'm not talking about myself, but other men, you know, uh, but I think that that having the using animal sounds in particular really plays into that as a subconscious thing too. Brings yeah, brings back the the, the caveman instincts, I guess, yeah. if you want to look at it that way. The primal instincts. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Very much so. But you know, in Star Wars, I can't remember now if it was the lightsaber sound or the uh the the laser rifle sound, but one of the things that they had blended into that was taking a pole and hitting those metal high tension wires that they use at the power poles. That was yeah. That was actually the laser sounds of the uh, of of some of the the uh, the ships. Oh, the um, ships. And, okay. Yeah, that was that was resonating a, a guy wire, uh, just hitting yeah. that and then and, and picking it up with a contact mic. Um, and I yeah, I have fun doing that with slinkies. Uh, the same kind of thing to get that that type of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I have an experiment on the on the on the calendar too. One of the things I heard, uh, and I don't know whether this is true or not. Um, is that the startup sound of the lightsaber was actually the, uh, the, the sound of the lightsaber was, was obviously the, uh, a microphone going by, um, the television set that was humming, that kind of thing. But mm-hmm. the startup where it, where it first launches, um, is, uh, rumored to be a, uh, airline life vest that's self, ex- self expanding, you know, when you pull the cord. Huh. Um, so of course <clears throat> I had to, uh, uh, I had to rely on Amazon, and I found <laughs> I found someone that actually had a a, uh, a a vest available. So that's sitting in the studio, waiting to be waiting to be activated. <laughs> oh well, you'll have to let me know how that goes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll let you know on that one. One of the things I thought too that they might have used for the ships flying by was the sound of a semi rushing by. A perfect example of if it's if if it gets your attention it works i mean as right. long as you're not going as long as you're not going well here's a you know here's a sci-fi ship in the future going by but it sounded like a you know mac truck you don't <laughs> yeah. want that but if you can relate to it that's back to what i was talking about before is if someone is used to hearing a semi truck buzz by them uh at at a big speed and and that 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 emotional impact that it that happens when that happens um, if they can translate that to that experience and add to it, why not? It, it, oh, exactly. It's a good starting point. Yeah. Well, sometimes they they almost roar depending on the weather conditions. I, I don't know if the road has to be slightly wet or you know what it is, but there's times where it, it almost feels like a an animal roar when they come by. Yep, absolutely. Well, then there's other times, and I've talked about this on the show before, where you have things like, uh, you know, the Batman movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger, where he's got the freeze gun and he's freezing everything and he freezes this dinosaur statue and it breaks and it starts falling to the ground and it screams. And as somebody who's done a little bit of Foley work in my day, I I find that really awkward. Uh, it can be distracting. I mean, that's and that's. That's the responsibility of a couple of people in the business. I mean, the sound supervisor needs to needs to kind of overview everything, but then this then the sound effects editor or the sound designer are working on that scene. Yeah, you you kind of need to to analyze and really kind of go through the thought process. Um, Randy Tom actually just uh, on Facebook put out a uh, a really interesting post that he. Uh, shared with everybody about how he would look at a script um, and analyze what the steps he goes through when he's looking at what sound effects he needs to start collecting or what he wants to do. Uh, and it, it's a real interesting read. I'll have to send that along to you. Yeah, please do. It, it, it is very fascinating. And what's really funny about it is I'm willing to buy this world where Batman exists where these towns have these ridiculous amount of skyscrapers. I mean, trillions of dollars have to be poured into the city, yet everyone seems to be fairly poor. Uh, There's a guy who's walking around in a frozen suit. And and I'm willing to accept all of these things, but I'm not willing to accept bad sound design. (laughs) (laughs) And that's why you and I are friends. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Well, let me, let me ask you a little bit about when you're recording something like, uh, you know, uh, machine gun fire or any kind of explosive, really, I've tried to sample drums before just to kind of learn how it works and and really appreciate it. But I, I have a hard time getting past that attack and getting a clean sound while catching the decay at a good level. But you seem to be able to do that without a problem. Is it a lot of work for you now or is it something that just really comes naturally? couple of couple of different things that 
hopefully, I mean, and first of all, thank you very much for saying that. Yeah. It's like, it's like you know, because because a lot of times when you're when you're working on something and and it's just I do the best I can, but uh, you know, I I never really know until till it's over with and someone. That, with, that I respect, like you, actually says, "Good job." It's like, oh, okay, good. Um, <laughs> but, but there's, it's an interesting for me. Sound effects recording is an interesting blend um, of taking um, the technology that's out there, but also taking the theory of, let's say, miking a drum kit. Miking a drum kit is very similar to recording explosions. Uh, there's a huge transient that happens. You want to get the air that happens because if you too, if you mic a drum kit too closely and don't have those overheads, it's not the same sound. Um, so you have to take that whole concept of recording into consideration. Mm -hmm. So if I'm recording an explosion or gunshots, it's you would be amazed at how many different layers are in there of the same sound. I'll have a microphone I'll, and I'll and I'll just like what do you use? What kind? Of, what type of microphone do you use to mic a kick drum or a snare? probably a dynamic because those can handle higher sound pressure levels. So I will have a dynamic mic closer to the, to the explosion just to get that, uh, to capture that transient. And then I'll have, um, I'll have, you know, stereo pairs off into the distance, just like you would overheads to capture that reflection because it's, you would be amazed at it when you hear a dramatic gunshot, it's a lot of it is the after sound that makes it uh, not just the quick transient. So it's the same thing. We spent um, uh, a while back, we actually rented um, uh, Studio One at Capitol in LA uh, for two days. And all we did, we had 75 microphones set up and we spent the entire time um, recording, um, you know, large concert drums to, to, uh, to like five or six trash cans, um, railroad car uh, suspension springs, all these kind of different instruments or, or, or things that we recorded the percussion to. And I could not tell you how much I appreciated the, the, um, the, just the knowledge and the care of, um, Chandler was our engineer at, at for those, um, uh, sessions. And you could just tell the, the quality of the recording and the way he set the room up and the way he set things up, that is, it, it just reminded me how important it is for recording technique mm -hmm. and to put your headphones on. If you, if you're, if you're trying to figure out where to place a microphone uh, around a, uh, you know, a drum head or something like that. Um, you know, I love, I love it when some of my students will go, well, you know, I said, you know, where do you, how do you mic a snare? And they'll, they'll recite something that they've read or been told. And it's like, no, you mic a snare by knowing the, knowing the concept of miking a snare, but it, it Oh, you know, the final thing is, what does it sound like? Where's the microphone? What is it? I mean, you, you talked about John Bonham and, and that sort of thing. I mean, and that was a, if I remember correctly, those guys used what, three microphones to record that his kits? I believe so. Um, yeah. 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 So it's, I mean, in, and I dare anybody to try to tell me that those weren't big sounding drums. Oh, they were huge. <laughs> they well, were huge. I yeah. Think, so I think he was using a 26 inch kick drum, if I'm not mistaken. But, but, but the, but not only that is a great sounding, you know, uh, kick drum, but then where to put the microphone to capture that sound. Uh, and, and, and those guys were smart enough to, uh, you know, to listen, say, let's put the mic here. Well, let's move it three inches this way or that, that way. Um, and so it, it is important to kind of, um, one experiment a little bit. But also, like I said earlier, know the rules so that you can break them. Know, know the whole concept of, of, you know, why would you use a dynamic mic? Well, because the diaphragm reacts differently to high pressure levels than a condenser. Um, and so knowing those kind of things, you know what to grab uh, or, or, you know, and where to place things and what's going to happen if you, you know, if you want to break the rule and put, put something a lot closer so you get that distortion, know, you know, know that that's why you're doing it. Right. And even just looking at the main difference between the way that you would mic a kick drum and the way you would mic a snare is when you're hitting a kick, you're forcing the air directly at the microphone, whereas a snare is angled off to the side. So that's going to be a completely different recording experience between those two mics. And even something is, is minor as how you're tuning the two drum heads. If you have, you know, if you have bottom and top head on those things, mm -hmm. um, the, the tuning of them can change everything, the way they, the way they interact with each other. Um, buddy of mine, Steve Wilmette, who 
did all the uh, music for the original Guitar Hero before they started using masters. He did he did all the all the music. That if you, if you played uh, if you played Guitar Hero and played against uh, Lucifer or whatever the Lucifer playing Devil went down to Georgia, uh, that's Steve. That's Steve's guitar work. Oh yeah. Um, and so he is incredible at at listening and his ears are, he teaches me so much every time we get together for lunch and we, we start talking technical and it's like, uh, I keep learning from him, uh, his ability to listen to something and go, okay, this doesn't quite sound right. How do we do here? Um, and, and so that, that to me is, um, just knowing that that's just the more you can learn. Uh, and, and I, 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 if there's ever a time that I stop wanting to go back in time and have a second chance at recording something because I think I can make it better. Um, if if that ever happens where I stop thinking I can make something better, I I think I will have lost my my drive and my passion because I I could open a pro tool session from uh, from six months ago and go oh I wish I would have done this I wish I would have done that right know? yeah um, and if it's a major enough difference I will change it you know and that, that uh, and it's fun to get that that feedback loop where you know when to <laughs> you know when to move on but but not giving up until it really is the way you want it. Exactly. And and that's the thing though is it's that open-mindedness. It's that willing to say I don't know everything that that keeps that drive going because once you do, once you feel like you've learned everything, then everything else just becomes repetition. There's no more experimentation because why would you need to experiment if you know everything? Yeah, absolutely. I mean it's and and let me, you know, I'll, I'll talk about the the industrial metal contact instrument a little bit here, just because it's the last thing I've been working on. I'm kind of my, I've been focused on it. Yeah, actually, I but, was just about to get to that, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the the amount of the amount of of learning and 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 process that went into that, uh, I'm really proud of it. I mean, it's it it goes from because most of it, the, the whole concept of these instruments that I'm starting to put out are they're they're sound design series, mm. um, so that it's it's. Uh, organic sounds or sounds that then you can manipulate. And, and what I wanted to create, I had it in my head and I heard it, which was an instrument of some really massive sounds that then you could then uh, tweak to your heart's content. And in order to do that, there was a lot of that process that I didn't know, but, but I knew I had to start with some really, really good samples. I needed to record those. So we spent time out in the desert, um, you know, blowing up Tannerite and, and doing plastic explosives Many, many watermelons gave their life for that. <laughs> and, um, and, and then, you know, other, other types of explosions. And then uh, I had uh, a couple of buddies who had um, experience with automatic weapons who were very safety conscious. We went out and we recorded uh, several afternoons of, of gunfire for that. And, and then, I, then I spent time in a junkyard. I spent time um, on construction sites recording huge dumpsters. Uh, I spent time at um, another sound person's um, uh, vacation ranch up in Northern California and they had uh, diesel fuel tank, storage tanks, that sort of thing. And I banged on those. And, um, and so it, it collected a good, a good base right. from there, then mastering those, editing those, manipulating those and making them sound bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, and then, then it became, okay, how can we use context power to then even make it better? And it was fun working with uh, Chris Wind was a a coder and programmer that worked with me on this one. Mm -hmm. And we spent many, many, many late night hours with, you know, after I play with it going, well, I wish, you know, I wish we could adjust the start time on the front page, that kind of thing. And it was before you know it, he'd go back and, and write the script for it. And we got it to do that. So hopefully um, it's, it, it turned out to be a very functional instrument with some good sounds. Well, it, it definitely did. I mean, I, I had so much fun even just, uh, Pulling it up to begin with, well, first of all, knowing you as well as I do, I knew I was going to get something quality when I when I downloaded it. So I that wasn't even a worry. Whereas so many of these things that you buy, you're like, if you don't really know the company, it's kind of iffy, but you're willing to, you know, lay down a few ducats for it. But the first thing that that really gripped me was as soon as I hit download, it was done downloading. And I thought, did I miss something? Did I not get the the audio files from this? Because this downloaded very, very quickly. And I opened up the zip file and I looked through it. I'm like, well, everything that looks like it's supposed to be there is there. And I loaded it up and I started playing it and boom, everything was there and it sounded great. But I love the fact that you're not overloading your libraries with 800 sounds that I don't care about 650 of them. Well, it, and it, this, that actually, thank you for saying that because this was actually part of the plan. Because one of the things uh, in talking with other developers is and, and, and users was, you know what? Um, 
Okay, I've, I, I'll use my needle in a haystack reference. It's like if you're looking to find the needle in the haystack, would you rather someone gave you more hay or more needles in the pile? <laughs> right. And so, yeah, so so what I wanted to do was provide the needles and get rid of a lot of the hay because sometimes in our lives we have too many choices and and we can get off and get excited about going, "Hey, look, it's a huge library." But it, but if you're not going to use 90% of it, it's a waste of hard drive space and a yeah. waste of time searching through it. So what I trying what I'm trying to do with these sound design series contact instruments and I'm and I'm halfway through working on the next one. Um and what I'm trying to do is provide really, really usable sounds and then give you the flexibility within the instrument to then uh, change them to your heart's content. Mm -hmm. So as long as the foundation is there, it's because I don't want to eat up a bunch of hard drive space with with crappy sounds. Right. So so I'm, I am I really intended from the start to keep the download um, uh, small, as small as possible. I, and I really appreciate that as an end user because I've got right now, I'm, I'm fill, uh, my current sample drive is almost full and that's a four terabyte hard drive. And I, I'm like, how many of these sounds do I actually use? It's nice to have one or two uh, instruments that are really well-rounded that you can just jump into in a, in a pinch and it has almost everything. Like whether you're using, uh, you know, like a Goliath or something like that, that's kind of like a, the old synthesizer that's a be all catch all instrument. But once you have one or two of those, you've got that. Now it's really time to hone into the specifics of what you're looking for. And you buy a synthesizer and it's maybe, you know, eight, nine gigs worth of sounds. And you're like, hey, that's great. I'm getting all these sounds. But they're so overwhelming because you're just going to keep going back to the 10 or 15 that you really love. And the rest is just a waste. Well, and the other thing I try to do with the instrument, uh, I'm I'm pretty proud of the preview mode, mm -hmm. which is um, which is when you first open up the instrument, it has every key is a different sound, so you can actually go through and listen to all the main samples um, and and find one that you want to start playing with, um, and because I got really tired in my just a lot of this came from my own experience of using uh, instruments in in my sound design, and that that was that I got tired of hitting the the, the arrow so that I'd have to load a new sound every time I wanted to hear a different sound when I was searching through it. And then all of a sudden you decide, uh, what was that sound 20 sounds ago that I liked? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, and then it's like, you know, it's like if, you know, so you're either jotting down the names of the instrument, you know, the, the, the settings or, or you're having to go back and back and back and back. And it, to me, it wasted a lot of my time. Yeah. So I wanted to create a instrument that had a preview mode that you could go through and listen to, you know, 25, 30 samples but then go, wait a minute, what was that one back there? And you could easily go back to that uh, and go, oh, that one. And then you could, then there was a method to select that and then start messing with the sound effects and messing with the pitch and messing with the time and that sort of thing. So I, I really try to design this instrument uh, so that it would speed the workflow up because I, I just don't like wasting my time when I'm working with it. Right. And when you're, when you're in the middle of writing something, and I mean, you probably work under some pretty strict deadlines sometimes. I get very fast turnaround times at times. Uh, that kind of flexibility is amazing because it does save you a lot of time. But I could also argue that you could use that uh, as a patch itself. Like you could put that just the sampler on one track if you're going to use maybe one or two different sounds that aren't going to be uh, hit at the same time. And you don't even have to go into the the individual sound mode. You could actually just use the preview. That see that that would be. That would be a great way to use it. Um, I just, uh, you know, the thought process for me originally was just to give you a lot more flexibility. But yeah, it, you could, you can, you could play it like a drum kit if you wanted to. Oh, sure. Yeah. And the sounds are very, very quality. I mean, there's nothing that's too heavy in the attack that it's not usable. I think it's a very playable library. And that was one of the other things that I really appreciated about it was the quality of it, but also the balance from one sound to another, because there's a lot of libraries, especially in percussion, where it's not balanced out very well. Okay, good. I'm glad, I'm glad, I'm glad you're feeling that way too, because that was, um, that was, there was an effort put toward that too, is kind of keeping it where if you started playing something, it wouldn't, one wouldn't overwhelm you and, and one wouldn't be too soft. Yeah, There's a lot all. of effort that goes into sample instruments. I, I, I respect a, a lot of the other guys that put stuff out. Um, there is so much more. It's not just throwing stuff into contact going, okay, we're done. Um, if, if it's going to be a quality instrument, there's, I mean, this, this took months of, um, I mean, you, there was, it wasn't, it wasn't just a week of editing and mastering. I mean, 
getting the sounds right properly trimmed and, and to sample accurate uh, points of of edits um i mean it it took it took a full month probably of going through and working on these sounds and massaging them to get them right just in their just in their sample state right and you know on an earlier episode uh, i had eduardo terralante from uh, best service uh, they distribute his libraries and he's amazing He's he is he is amazing. One of the nicest people you'll you'll ever meet. Isn't he? I mean, what, yeah, yeah. He really is. But uh, but what was you know we talked about the the amount of in depth work it takes to just modify one sample, and he's got hundreds of thousands of samples and that he's working with for every instrument that he puts out, which is why he only does one a year because it's the the amount of work that goes into it is it's it's unbelievable. What you get on the on the front end is so it looks so simple compared to what goes into it in the back end. Absolutely. And that, and that, that speaks to a well-designed instrument. The less you think it is that complicated, um, that probably means the more work went into making it that way. Yeah. Well, you know, we were talking earlier about these, you know, one dial, uh, you know, uh, different, uh, effects, plugins. plugins, plugins yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Plugins that you can use. And I use, uh, IDC from Audionamics on every one of my shows now, and it's simply a dial. That's it. But it, the, in yep. the background, you know that there's just, you know, you can just see a sea of numbers calculating constantly in your head, just, you know, <laughs> that, that's affecting everything. Uh, but I love what Contact's done. I love that they've provided this, uh, this, this engine that's so flexible. I mean, when people want things, they'll work with you to, uh, to change it up, to add things to it that they didn't think of. And if you look back to the, like, you know, the first couple instances of Contact, it's nothing like it is now. I mean, it's like looking at uh, one of those cars that you had to crank up with a handle. <laughs> yes, yep. <laughs> compared yep. to a Ferrari, you know. Yeah, they, and they they have they have not rested on their laurels, and I think that's why it's still you know that is the go to sampler probably for most people. Yeah, um, and there there are other good ones out there, but I think if you were to say what is the industry standard sampler, um, you know, ninety percent of the time, someone's going to say contact. Probably, I would agree. And and there's so many companies that are making the, their libraries just designed for contact as well. And you don't really see that with too many other companies, unless you're doing, uh, you know, like hip hop and trance and stuff like that. There's uh, what Zebra, I think it is. Um, but really, for for film scoring, for rock music, for just about anything else, it's going to be contact. And even if the they can't spell it right, I'll use it. <laughs> that is true. And I, and and I'm kind of excited. I'm excited to see how uh industrial metal gets used by the industry. Uh cuz my you know my background is is sound design. And so uh you know a, a lot of it started with cinematic um sound design, movie trailers uh and and effects in movies and videos in mind. But then once we started working with it, I I mean I kind of set up the the, the palette of samples where you have the low rumbles down in the low end of the of the keyboard and as you go up you have more you know hits and, and impacts and then some some different um, special effect type type sounds uh, bending metal that sort of thing mm -hmm. but I'm curious to see and we talked about earlier how um, how an organic sound can can kind of change the brain's reaction to something I'm curious to see if and and listen to how this might get used in um, EDM, mm -hmm. uh, or in, uh, or in, uh, some hip hop tracks as, as some augmented sounds. Um, I think it could really, it's a, it's a, it could be a very interesting spice. And I'm curious to hear from people, uh, how they use that. I think this kind of library really does lean itself to that. And if you, if you look at a lot of songs that have really intelligently layered in sound design to the music, uh, you know, like thinking of uh, like Whip It by Devo, the way that they had, it wasn't an actual whip that they used, but it was that sort of whip sound. And to take that concept and say, all right, but what if we layered in a kick drum with that and, get, and made it a little punchier? What if we would have added, you know, a little bit of a ting at the end, at the, at the end of the snap? You know, I think that this kind of library really uh, would add itself to some really good layering. And I would say rap, even, uh, you know, industrial music, obviously, but rock, I, I think that you could really use this in just about anything. I'm looking forward to hearing what people use it for. I really am. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious I'm, too. I'm encouraged. And it's uh, it's definitely something that uh, it, it sounds like a simple percussion library, but really it's so much more than that. And I think that's the that's the key is getting people to understand that it's not just a drum library because it's not that at all. 
which uh, again, thank you. That's why walkthrough videos like you did for me are so important because I think we really need to uh, demonstrate and educate uh, on 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 these kind of things. Well, thank you for allowing me to do that. I actually had a lot of fun uh, putting that together. Uh, but let me ask you, I, I really, really love the design of the effects section that you have because it's, you know, there's the, the main interface, uh, and then there's the effects interface. And that is just so incredibly simple to use. And if, if people are smarter than me and actually read the sticky note that you put on the screen, they'll understand it even better <laughs> than I did. But, uh, but I love that interface because it's not like you have to go to another section and open something up. You just click on it. There it is. It's all in a line, very simple to use. Well, the, you have to. Uh, I have to explain why this instrument is designed the way it is. It's designed for the, the 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 simplest mind to use, which is my mind. <laughs> I, I I I designed this so that I couldn't screw it up. <laughs> and so let me tell you, that means that means it's pretty simple to use. But no, every I, every, every time I re, you know what I, what I did is over all these years of using different contact instruments, I would you know in the back of my head I would go, oh, I wish it would do this. I wish it would do that. Oh, that's how that is. And um and so I wanted to keep it as simple. Um, and if 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 half the world is like me and and doesn't want to read the manual. Um, I don't. And it's one of my biggest problems. And that's, that's another thing I'd, if anybody, if anybody picks up, uh, industrial metal, um, make sure that you take the time because it it's a, it is another step to take the presets, the snapshots and load them into your computer because it, it's, it's probably, uh, you know, a, twice as much material that, that I worked on and massaged and created snapshots of. And if you're like me, uh, so many times those extra little bonus things, it's like, Oh, I'll get to it. You know, right. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and you miss that out. So, um, so it, it, I tried to design it so that, uh, it was, it was really, um, intuitive. Um, so the main page has simple bypass on and off switches for your effects. But if you wanted then to tweak those effects, you can get deeper in. So you can use it as simply as you want to, or you can get as deep into it as you want to also. Right. Well, and, and that's the thing. There are certain effects that you can obviously just, you know, play around with and get the desired effect, like a delay or a flange. But when you start getting into tape, for example, that's something that really takes an ear to make it work. It's not something that you're going to hear as dramatically as you would a, a, a distortion. Correct. And and it and it, it it also depends on those are the effects that it depends on the sound that you're working on. So they're very they're, true. Um, yeah. So you really have to listen as you adjust it. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, is I've watched a lot of tutorials where they talk about how to set up your sounds for mastering uh, in your mix. And they talk about doing things that you really don't hear any more than just the slightest difference to. And that's that's if you have a really in tune ear. But when you go to master, you realize by taking that step, you've done something that has made a huge difference. And I think that's where it comes back to that education part of it is, yeah, you have the interface. Yes, it's easy to use, but you should also know what you're using and how to use it. Because something like the EQ, the tape, the compressor, you have to have a little bit of knowledge for that. Yes, I agree. I agree. Yeah. But the, I love the uh, the flange on it. That is such a beautiful wide scope that you've got on that from the the really quick to the long drawn out flange. Uh, I, I thought that sounded fantastic. That's one of my favorite parts. <laughs> yeah. And, and every, I think everybody will have their their uh, a, a different um, a, a different favorite effect for uh, for me. The uh, it's labeled I think it's labeled trans, but the transient designer in that. Uh, oh, yeah. I think contact did a good job with that. So for a lot of these, if you're using this percussion sounds, uh, you can really bring out that that percussive nature of some of these sounds with using the transient designer. I agree. Now, let's talk about just the the visual of the interface, because I really love the the GUI that you designed. I, I really think it kind of, you know, like I said in the walkthrough video, like I kind of feel like I'm in one of those, uh, you know, nuclear movies where I'm walking in a lab that maybe isn't really the safest place to walk in. And uh, you know, you're just you're hearing these sounds that you probably shouldn't be hearing and you don't know whether you're going to live or die. I, I love the visual just loading it up and looking at it, it really put me in like a, a good movie. Uh, you know what? I, I, I have to credit um, so many people on the, on the GUI design because it was one of those things where we, we actually did sit down and say, you know, we had a conference on what, what do we want this thing to feel like? And there is a, a former marketing director for Tascam, Eric Larson, who's just a creative genius. Um, he, he actually, we, he and I were talking and he goes, 
I picture this thing as just something that you found in a underground bunker that some, you know, s- some army or, or secret uh, government agency started building it and, and added on to it and pieced it together. And it's, it's, it's not, uh, it's not steampunk, but it's, you know, it's this kind of militaristic, uh, uh, old lost and found kind of thing. Yeah. And, and it's like, so we talked to, uh, to Peter was uh, uh, our graphic designer and he, uh, he, he, he ran with it and, uh, and just started, started, you know, gathering different pictures. He would take pictures of different electronic instruments and send it over going, is this, is this the feel? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we started working on that and we changed things up and we worked on it for quite a while. Uh, and a lot of effort was put into that to not only, um, to keep that balance though, there's a huge balance between keeping it, you know, if fanciful or, or too different and keeping it functional. Mm -hmm. So there, I, I really have to say that the graphic designer on this, um, it, it, as part of the team did a great job of balancing that. I think it's very usable, but at the same time, it's fun to look at. Yeah, for sure. And, and underground bunker, that's, that's a great description because uh, that's definitely something that, that I got the feel of. And when you, when you're in that mood, then when you hear the sounds, you're like, yeah, these are the kind of sounds I would expect to hear in that sort of environment. So I thought that was fantastic. Uh, and I, it's one of the things I'm getting excited about because uh, we, we've released this and we're in the marketing stage on it, but we're also, the the, the plan is to continue uh, to put out quite a few of these uh, instruments that are keeping the structure relatively the same so that you feel comfortable with it. If you, if you were to get, uh, you know, the, the uh, one that's bullets and booms, let's say, um, it's still you understand where the effects page is, where the, where the bypass switches are, where, where everything is. So you're comfortable with it. So the more you use our instruments, the more familiar you are, the easier it becomes, but the visual experience will be drastically different and just as exciting, I hope, and, and intuitive as to what sounds you're expecting. Yeah, I would, I would say that I, that would be my expectation for the next one. Uh, I'm sure it's going to fall in line with this one and almost like you could just put them end to end and you would see that consistency from one to another, regardless of what the sound type is. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Well, I, I love it. I, I'm so glad that you put the time into creating this and your whole team, really, because I think it's a fantastic instrument. It's something that I can imagine I'll be using quite a bit. Uh you know, the funny thing is that when you look at it, it just the, between the download size and the interface, like it looks like it's a small thing, but it's not. I mean, there's it's really a massive thing. I think it's just that we're so programmed into the fact that, you know, if you're if you're paying 30 or 40 dollars or 100 dollars for something, if it's not 15, 16 gigs, you're getting ripped off. And but but you don't you just don't think about it, it's kind of like going to a restaurant and you're used to paying maybe 25 dollars for dinner. But you're also getting more food than you can eat in one sitting, and you're paying a lot of extra money for it, and most of that food's going to end up going to waste. Even if you take it home, it's not as good the next day, or you don't end up eating all the leftovers. And it just I, I like the idea of having something that I'm going to use and something that I'm just not going to get a lot of excess of. So I, I'm definitely looking forward to seeing what you release next. Well, that that, that uh, I, I promise that that's the philosophy we're going by is, is a... Uh, smaller library with more use. Yeah. Um, so, but, and that's, and which is counterintuitive. I mean, as you just said, people kind of, I mean, we've been taught to, Ooh, the bigger the library, the better it is. And that's obviously not always the case. Yeah. My hope is, and we're fighting a little bit of an uphill battle in that, but I think it's worth fighting. I really do. So, um, so thank you for spreading that word. Yeah. Well, I think, I think the, the concept will prove itself over time. It's a matter of just getting people to understand it going in and, and being willing to give it the chance of this isn't a huge, you know, you're not going to get 800 presets with this and you don't need 800 presets. What you need is right. this. If these are the sounds that you're looking for, you need this. And if you go in and explore and change and tweak these sounds to what you want to use, it is incredibly easy to save those as a snapshot preset for yourself. Mm -hmm. So, so you can actually build this library personally uh, into something huge. Yeah, that's very true. And you know, it's funny because you would think with something like a piano, for example, and please, for the love of God, please, people stop making piano libraries. We've got enough. (laughs) Uh, but for, for like a piano, there's so much that you can do. It's not even just a matter of reversing it or putting reverb or flange on it. There's so many different things you can do. You would think that percussion would be very limiting, but it's not. No, not at all. 
Um, I mean, think think back to the caveman days. And anything we bang on um, for percussion intent, um, there's it could be anything. Yeah, it really can. Um, and quite frankly, in I mean, one of the things I've been working on now, I've, I've, I'm diving deeply into ambisonic, and um, I. I, I, you know, when it was 110 degrees in Arizona, I actually on Amazon ordered a, uh, saucer sled, a snow, snow saucer. Oh yeah. And, and had that delivered, which the Amazon guy looked at me like I was crazy, <laughs> but I, I, I took that and I have, uh, I took about seven or eight ping pong balls, put the ambisonic mic in the, in the middle and just twirled these things around. Um, and, and just so they, they gave you this swirling effect, mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it, those are the things I'm always, I mean, it's like, who would have, who would have thought that there was a possibility of some rhythmic, uh, flavor that would come from that. Right. Um, or, or a lot of times I'll, uh, the other day I took a synth line from the modular Moog and ran that into a uh, guitar amp and, and to an, a remote speaker that was sitting flat. And, um, I, I poured, um, some beans that were from a tree pod that I had out front some, and th th they sat there and with the arpeggiated line, they popped up and down on the speaker physically. And I mic'd that and recorded that. And that added so much more flavor to it. So it's, it, it, the, I never want to stop looking for different ways to, to get those sounds, to capture those sounds um, and share those sounds. I love that. And, you know, that's a philosophy that I had uh, learned when I got my first synthesizer, which was a, uh, an, a Korg X3 sequencer. And one of the things that they said at the end of the manual was don't think of a sound as what it's labeled. Don't think of a bass guitar as a bass guitar. Think of it as a sound. Yes. And that really kind of opened my eyes to the fact that, yeah, we do tend to uh, categorize things a little too easily. Well, and, and, and what can you do with it? I mean, I, <laughs> I got laughed at the other day because I had a, uh, a bass guitar laying on its side um, and uh, I was rolling marbles down the strings i tuned it to uh, uh to a chord and rolled rolled marbles down it and that just sounded so interesting which then got me to do something really crazy i took one of my less expensive electric guitars and you'll know why when i explain what i did with it <laughs> here we go my my wife loves to feed birds so we've got these uh these like they're called love parrots or something but there's there's 50 of them hanging out in, in the backyard at the house sometimes at feeding time so i took uh, i took the guitar um, and ran it into a, uh, a handheld recorder, the direct box. And I had it sitting on two sawhorses and I just, I tuned it to a G an open G chord, um, and then sprinkled bird seed up and down the neck and walked away. And what I got was, um, five or six of the birds landed on the strings and pecked at the, at the, uh, seeds uh -huh. and, and created this really kind of weird, um, non-rhythmic, uh, atmosphere kind of sound. And because it was an electric guitar, you didn't get any of the chirping that was outside. You know, it was, it was all direct signal feed. So you got some really strange sounding stuff. Um, but you've got, <laughs> but it could have turned out terrible. I mean, who, who knows, but it's one of those, let's just try this. What the heck? Right. You know, do I, and, and that's uh, not everything, not every crazy experiment and sound I, I take on, you know, creates something that, that usable, right. but it's still, it's a learning experience. Right. And you know, the interesting thing is if you were recording a guitarist and you would have to record, you know, each individual string, then you would have to record them, you know, strumming the G chord. You can't get birds to come back and recreate that. <laughs> you know, I mean, you, you get what you get and it either works or it doesn't. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's, that's why I let it sit out there for a couple of hours. And you, that's, then you have to go back in Pro Tools and look at the waveform going, oh, where is something? You know, that kind right. of thing. Yeah. So, yeah. So. Well, let me, let me ask you about one other thing. You were talking earlier about, uh, you know, when you were in the studio recording all those drums and certainly in a situation like that, it's a very controlled environment. You can experiment, you can work with miking positions and things like that. But let's say we take another one of those amazing Rick Allen experiments where you're shattering an entire pane of glass. You don't have a lot of luxuries with that. How do you set something like that up for success? Well, the, the one thing to remember and keep in mind when you're doing that, you always have to remember you don't have a second take. You know, I mean, it's, it's when you're breaking a, you know, a four foot by eight foot piece of glass, um, you break it once. Uh, so you better... You better think about all the 
contingencies. Mm -hmm. And that's what I do. I've, 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 I've learned him and believe me, if I sound smug in my answer to that, that if, if I'm too fast at responding, it's not, it's not out of arrogance. It's out of, I have made so many mistakes that I've learned <laughs> yeah. and I'll probably still make mistakes. I keep learning every time I do right. it. But, um, one of the things I do, I've got a, a Foley stage set up, um, in what used to be a three car garage and it's, we've got sound panels up and that sort of thing. Um, and what I would do is I've got, um, clamps that I can, I can clamp on that large pane of glass and clamp that up vertically. So it's, it's hanging up and down, um, off the ground. Uh, and then I will actually, I mean, we'll probably use up to 17 microphones to record that. And the reason that is, is because we want one in about every position possible. And then we'll also have our inputs at different imp and one, one of my favorite things to do when I'm recording loud things is to Y off a lot of the new handhelds actually create a second file when you're recording at a, at a lower, um, input level. Mm -hmm. But what, uh, until that started to be popular, I would just have a XLR Y cable that would go to two different inputs. And one of the inputs would be set like maybe 12 DB lower than the other one. So that if it was louder than I expected, I, and it, it had digital distortion in one track, I might have be able to save it on the second track, that kind of thing. Right, yeah. So we, we set that up from every angle and different microphones. And so when we smash it, we'll take, we'll take that back in the studio and uh, you know, 16, 17 tracks will be there. We may only end up mixing off of four of those tracks, mm -hmm. but we have that, we have the ability. So it's not, it's not like the more mics make it sound better. That's not always the case, right. but by having more mics, we have more choices. In a situation where you don't get a second chance, yeah. you might as well get as many chances as possible in the post-production process. Well, sure, because as you shatter it, a piece of glass might fly off and hit one of the microphones and you know knock it out of position, or you'll hear that thump, or it might hit right across the recording surface. You know, I mean, there's so many things that could happen. And that's one of the things that I, th yeah, you know, you talk about learning by mistakes. One of the things that I've done now is um, that exact problem happened. I had an RE20 down and close low to uh, where the glass would hit because I wanted that, that uh, you know, dynamic uh, where it would, it would grab all that. And um, I kept getting shards of glass hitting the, the uh, microphone. So I actually thought about it, scratched my head. And I ended up going to uh, Joanne Fabrics, which is a, a chain of fabric stores and got a large needlepoint hoop that your grandmother would have done needlepoint with mm -hmm. those, these round wooden hoops that you can, that you can tighten. And, um, and then I went to uh, a Home Depot and got plastic screening and I put the screening in the, in the hoop. So the hoop's about 12 inches in, uh, uh, in, uh, from side to side. Mm -hmm. And so I put the screen in there, then s screwed that onto a two by four that was on the ground, put that in front of the microphone. So the glass would hit the plastic, uh, screen, which wouldn't hit, wouldn't ring like a metal screen would, it would just bounce off. And so uh, that solved that problem. So it's like, yeah, a lot of times with a lot of this crazy stuff, necessity is, is truly the mother of invention. Oh, sure. But here's where the challenge comes in, because for you to put something in front of the mic is now going to filter the sound. So you have to have something that would be able to catch the glass, but not, not muffle the sound. Correct. Uh, I mean, and, and uh, the story that I always like, always makes people laugh and blush and, and, and point fingers at me is my story of how I protect my microphones when I'm recording anything in a dusty, dirty environment or a moisture environment. Mm -hmm. Um, I will actually take an unlubricated condom and put that over the microphone. Um, which, which first off always explain why one, you just ordered 500 unlubricated condoms on Amazon to your <laughs> wife or your, or your significant other to your partner before, before that, that becomes obvious. Well, it's, it's and, a regular Friday night at the Allen house. I mean, yeah, exactly. You know. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. You've been you've been peeping through the windows. Haven't I know you? why you sound uh, <laughs> from that garage. So so it's it's so it, it is there. Are, there are ways to make sure that um, that you protect your gear while while still using it in some some dangerous situations. But doesn't a condom um, muffle the sound too much? Well, well, just just here. I'll, I'll put it this way. Just as a, most Trojan ads will tell you that it doesn't feel any different. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I, I will tell you that it doesn't sound any different and we're both lying, but, right. but with a true thin membrane like that, um, it actually does pass the, the, the sound waves, um, just fine. You're not, you're not, uh, you're not, 
you're not getting any reflection or or diffusion on that. I mean, it, it, it's interesting. I, and I kind of learned that concept from another buddy of mine who helped me make some bass traps, a uh, great studio designer. And he, he actually, when we were making this one bass trap, he put regular painter's tarp plastic uh, behind it. And I'm going, wait a minute, is that going to change anything? And he goes, no, it actually, it's, it's, it's part of the property of that. It's uh, um, you actually want that to absorb some of the vibration. Interesting. Um, yeah. So it, bottom line is listen to, you know, and that's I, again, back to how do you mic a drum kit? Listen to it. And it's, if it sounds good, fine. If it doesn't, then, you know, then that's not the right choice. So take the condom off or whatever. But I also, I also want to protect my investment. I mean, I don't want to take, I don't want to Sennheiser four four sixteen shotgun microphone um, getting ruined because we were recording swimming pool splashes. Right. Um, yeah. You know, uh, there's, there's, there's that trade-off. Yeah. I just, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of interested because I, I never would have even thought about putting a condom over a microphone unless I was going for a muffled effect. I don't think that that would have even entered my mind. I have seen in a theater where they've used condoms over the uh, receiver packs just to keep any moisture off of the, you know, from the sweat of the actor or whatever. Sweat, yeah. Uh, yeah but yeah. I would have never thought about putting it over a recording instrument unless I was trying to go for a muffled effect. Well, see, now I know how you're going to party on the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not waiting for the weekend. Uh, no, that's that's a great idea, though. But I, I I love that. I love that you're willing to just try things. And you know what? If it doesn't work, what was that? Five seconds of my life that it took me to find out it wasn't going to work. Now I can scratch that off the list. and Or I've created a scenario for maybe another thing that that might work for later on down the line. Exactly. You know? Yep. But that's how you do it. I mean, it's it's experimenting. It's willing to say... I don't know how this is going to work, but let's try it. And maybe we'll find some new way of doing something. I mean, if no one did that, then we wouldn't have anything today. And what I love about the internet and podcasts these days is that information can, can be shared. Um, I mean, if, if one or two people, you know, learn about that possibility from listening to your podcast, it's what a great thing. I mean, it's, we're spreading the knowledge uh, and, and it, it, it's, I learned from so many other people. And if someone can learn, anything for me i'm 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 actually honored <laughs> well i think that that people learn a lot from you whether you realize it or not i mean just watching the the videos and stuff that you've posted uh, even the one of of the glass break which i really enjoyed uh i think there's so much that people learn just by watching and you're you're a good teacher so i think that they're really lucky down at the school to have you now i'm i'm really glad that you're taking the opportunity to do that and i love that it's a, it's a give and take that you're learning things too Absolutely. Yes. I mean, I, I'm, I'm having the time of my life. I, I, really I love am. the idea that guys like you and me, we know how to splice tape. We know how to record on an analog console. You know, we, we know how to set an EQ without having a preset because we've done it the hard way. Uh, but I also love the idea of, of mixing in with people that didn't come from that school of thought because they have a different approach to doing the same things that we did. And I like being able to learn both. Yes, absolutely. And and that's where I think um, that that's how I personally try to, um, I don't want to become irrelevant. I don't want to become an old timer who just knows how to do something from the old days. Yeah. Uh, I, I constantly challenge myself and it's been, it's been amazing my whole career. It's been, it's been a great, great possibility. I was, I was a beta tester for the Sinclair system, which was one of the first huge sampling systems. It was, you know, like, Two hundred fifty, three hundred thousand dollars for one of those systems, and I just happened to be a lucky person working at a facility that was able to beta test that. So I was able to get in on that. I was my first sampler was an Akai six twelve that I think recorded yeah, maybe one second was the RAM, you know, the, the, the ability. You know, it's like and 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 that's not exaggerating. It truly yeah, was. Yeah. And and uh, um and and the storage for it was these little mini discs that would record one sample on each side of the disc. So that's, you, so you couldn't save very many things. And then the, you know, then I, then I evolved into the S1000, uh, you know, and then I started working Pro Tools when it was Sound Tools, when it was a two track recording system. Oh yeah. So I, 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 I'd never want to stop, um, learning and trying new things and doing that and staying on the cutting edge. Um, even if it's stumbling along that edge, uh, it, it to me, it, it has kept my brain fresh and kept my creativity um, a little more charged up. Oh, absolutely. And, and I got to say, before we go, I, uh, I was listening to a podcast yesterday that was talking about the old uh, Atari Adventure cartridge, which came out in the early 80s. And the capacity of that cartridge was four kilobytes. 
<laughs> you, I mean, you can't write a greeting to it. You can't write the headline of an email for four kilobytes now. It's uh, it's really amazing to see how storage, especially in the last you know three or four years, now we've got ten terabyte drives available. They're a little pricey, of course, but they're available. I have um, when I was using the S one thousand, I've I used these Cyquest drives, I which were these those. removable cartridges. Yeah, and I and I can't remember. I, I'm going to have to go back and look because. I think part of me doesn't want to go back and realize how expensive they were, but I can't remember the price. The, yeah. The price point for what amount of storage you got, I probably could have purchased my first house for cash if I had, if yeah. I had not bought all that storage. And now I think my iPhone has more storage than all those cartridges put together. Oh, yeah. So we live in, we live in some wonderful times. Yep. Um, we live in, in some times where uh, the, if, if you, if you manage your creativity and, and work on that and develop the passion and, 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 get things going that way there isn't a there hasn't been a better time to be alive to to create with that uh with that brain oh that's you know, so you true can do so many more things so yeah. true i mean i remember so. when i had my uh one of my first ibm computers and it and we got up to eight megs of ram not gigs megs of ram i was just i yeah. was like yeah. i'm never gonna need this much <laughs> you know or <laughs> or you know the four megabyte hard drive and you're like I can store all the pictures I'll ever take for the rest of my life on this thing. And <laughs> you look back now and you think about how much we paid for that. Like I think to, to do the hundred megabyte uh, hard drive Ram expansion or hard drive expansion on my Amiga 500 was like a hundred dollars. And you know, that, that, that was for a hundred megabytes. It, yeah. It, 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 uh, and, and I'm, I'm sure that we'll, we'll, in another couple of years, another five years, another ten years, wherever this technology evolves and takes us, we'll be we'll be laughing about you know the first solid state drives coming out and be so expensive and so small. Right? You know? Yeah. It it it. Uh, it, it we, we live in times where the technology is uh, amazingly fast paced in change, and um, I look forward to that. But at the same time, my caveat there is I need to remind myself every once in a while to stop, slow down, and learn what we currently have. That's true. Uh, to the you know, and and not just uh, I I knew I be, I was becoming a, a plug in whore one time when um and I and I will compliment Waves for the for their non greedy handling of this situation. Um, there was a plug in that went on sale uh, on on one of the sale days and. And I saw it and I went, that's an interesting plugin. I think I'll get that. It was, it's only 29 bucks mm -hmm. or whatever. So I went, I went to Wave's site. I, I opened up my account and I purchased it. Uh, and be, just before it would let me charge my charge card, it said, uh, you already have this plugin. Are you really, <laughs> do you, you know, do you, do you want to purchase it again? And I'm like, oh no, I don't. And it's like, it was embarrassing, yeah. but it reminded me that, that uh, it's like, okay, um, maybe I should go back and again, look at what plugins i have <laughs> i i did that very same thing i can't remember if it was waves or somebody else now but i had that same alert and i felt i just sunk i just sunk in myself I'm like why don't i know what i have <laughs> yeah, it's like i probably shouldn't tell that story but i have to admit it i mean it's like it's it's real it, but it's a great <laughs> warning to us because we do tend to especially when there's sales going on and we get a little ahead, ahead of ourselves, and maybe we bought something we forgot about it i actually have a spreadsheet that has all the plugins that i own and what they do so that if i like you know i haven't what what kind of compressor haven't i used yet and i could just go to my list and i organize it by compressor and there it is i've learned now to look at that list before i make a purchase but I felt the same way that you did. I'm like, what am I doing? I'm oh, a whore man. to buy them, but I'm not, I don't even use them. I know. I, okay. Quick story sure, here too, yeah. that this, this, this is many, many, many years ago, but um, when the S1000 sampler, they were starting to, uh, to uh, improve that. And they came out with the S2000. And this was just before um, Mark of the Unicorn came out with their sampler, uh, software sampler. So software samplers still hadn't really hit the market yet. So it was it was more um, it, it was more hardware samplers. So of course, I I purchased the S two thousand from Sweetwater, and my rep goes, "Well, uh, okay, the that'll be free shipping." And I went, "Oh no, I have to have it right away. So I, I want FedEx shipping." So I paid extra for the FedEx shipping. It arrived. Um, I think we closed the studio for, for holidays at that point in time. And, and so it sat for a bit. And by the time I came back, um, the new Mark of the Unicorn um, sam software sampler had come out. So I started playing with that. I am not exaggerating. The S2000 sitting in a, in a rack in the back of my studio now has never been powered up. <laughs> 
I paid I, I, I paid extra money to have it FedEx because I had to have it right away. Right. <laughs> and it never got unboxed until probably five years later. It got rack mounted, and, but it has never been powered up. Oh, so, wow. uh, you know, don't don't always assume that the, the next new thing, ha- you have to have it right away. <laughs> yeah, boy, that's so true. And, I, and now that you say that, I got to ask you one more question before I let you go about synthesizers. Sure. Uh, you've met Bob Moog, have you not? Um, I actually did not meet Bob before he passed away, oh. but um, I became actually good friends with his daughter, um, Michelle, who has now opened, she runs the Bob Moog um, Foundation, mm-hmm. uh, and and they just in Asheville just opened the Moog, uh, Moogseum, is what they're calling it. <laughs> um, sh- she is a huge advocate of saving his history and, and telling stories. And it was, uh, in fact, it was a couple of years ago at Moog Fest where I had a chance to meet her and, um, it, it, just an incredible person. And she's, um, she's doing, she's uh, pretty sure she's putting together a book that'll be pretty amazing. But his stories, I sat, it was supposed to be a half hour lunch that we went to. And literally I, I wouldn't let her go if <laughs> I think it was f- Four four hours, and that's how nice a person is. She actually then talked to me the next time I saw her. It wasn't oh, like wow. oh, no oh. restraining it's, order it's, or anything. It's, it's, yeah, it's yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but but the the stories she told um, about him were um, just just fascinating. What an interesting, uh, intelligent, and creative individual who absolutely did it for the love of it. Because if you look at the business model, he got screwed by so many different companies. Oh yeah, uh, over the over the years. Um, but he did he did what he loved to do. And I, his contribution, um, and and I, I've been a, a huge Moog fan for years. I, my first uh, my first synthesizer was an ARP. The next one was a Mini Moog, um, but I've got a full System Fifty Five um, modular system uh, in in the studio that um, that is you know people go well you know will you ever sell it? And I go no, I'll probably be buried in it. <laughs> it's like it's it's big enough to be a coffin, but I mean, it's one of those things where um, you know I. I I'm a believer. I, th- you know, I I still think I can hear the difference between a software Moog uh, plugin and and the uh, and the modular analog system. But I and some people say you're crazy. You can't. But uh, I I just I still love grabbing onto the knobs and knowing you know when you patch something from here to there, knowing that that signal is going to there, why it's going to there, um, and that's something you you have to you have to work to get that kind of feedback in a lot of the software instruments. Oh, that's very true. Um, and, and Korg uh, just last year released the, uh, the ARP Odyssey as part of their legacy VST collection. Uh, it sounds good, but I've never played an original, so I don't, uh, I don't have a point of comparison reference. Uh, I'm trying to remember then who was it that I saw you at? Was it maybe Keith Emerson? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Here's my Keith Emerson story. Okay. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was a couple, a couple of years back, um, before he passed away at NAM. um, Moog had their, that was when they were just re-releasing their system 55 modular systems. And so they had a really nice booth set up with all the different modular systems. And, um, I was there actually with, with Eric Larson and we're, we're talking in the booth when all of a sudden we hear the lucky man riff, you know, floating through the air mm. and, and, we both looked at each other and literally at the same time said, and if you need to beep this, you can beep this, but it's, um, it's who the F I guess you don't have to, who the F who the, and, and we did not say F who the F would have the gall to play a Keith Emerson riff here at Nam, And we turn and it was Keith Emerson. <laughs> the only legitimate person who could yeah. do that. And we, yeah. and we both went, yeah, yeah, I think he's earned the right to do that. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. And, you know, I, and, I had wanted to uh, to meet him, and I know he he typically appeared at NAM every year. And every time I went to the, the Moog booth, there would be a sign that said, you know, he'll be back. And uh, all right, well, I'll come back later. And I never got the chance to meet him. I'm so glad that that opportunity, because actually I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit of an introvert. And so I, I just thought, you know, I, I didn't want to bug him. And so I didn't want to go up and talk to him. And then uh, thank goodness, Eric goes, come on, how, you know, how many opportunities like this that happen? You take advantage of it and he's not going to mind. So I went up and we, we introduced ourselves and we started talking. So I actually had an opportunity to, to chat with him and that was an amazing experience. It really was. And then just, uh, that was a year later that, uh, that he passed away. Yeah. So it was, it was, I felt very lucky that I got a chance to talk to him. Another, another, uh, Nam has been an incredible uh, 
socializing experience for me too, because uh, Suzanne Shiani is another person I met uh, through that experience. And um, that's another incredible uh, pioneer in synthesizers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. You know, that's that's part of the fun of NAM is that you do get to see people that uh, you wouldn't normally have an opportunity to cross paths with, as well as being kind of a family reunion. Absolutely. You know, yep. In- I uh, I was lucky enough a couple of years ago, uh, found out kind of uh, oddly at the last minute that Alice Cooper was making an appearance over at the uh, Shure booth uh, for Shure Microphones. And uh, so I ended up spending half of my day standing in line waiting to see him. Uh, by the time that I got up there, uh, they were over their time. So it was just quick picture, hi, shake hands and move. But uh, it was worth it. It is. It's, and that's that's something about a lot of these conventions that I think, uh, again, we talked about, you know, the synergy of working with other people or being able to communicate with other people and share ideas with other people um, is is an important part of the process. So I, if, at least for me personally, going to uh, going to the AES or going to NAM, um, it, it, it's worth the the expense and effort. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, Rick, I can't thank you enough for taking some time out of your glass breaking schedule to come and uh, hang out with me here on the show. It's been an absolute joy. I've learned a lot from you and I'm sure that our listeners have as well. Uh, I usually have anywhere between four and 10,000 people listening to the show. So that's, that's the range of education for today. Uh, But thanks a lot, man. I I really wish you good luck with the library. I, I definitely encourage all my sound designer and composer friends to check it out. The link is in the show notes. Come back and see us again. Thank you very much. It was an honor and a pleasure. Uh, And I'll I'll talk to you soon. All right. You take care, my friend. Bye-bye. Man, I just love talking to people that are so passionate about what they do. And I, I love people that also know that they don't know everything. And even though they know a lot and they know they know a lot, they're still willing to know that there's more out there that they can learn and make things better and do their job better or find different ways to do their job. Uh, And especially for creatives, there's a million avenues to the answer and uh, and it's great uh, exploring them and finding out different things. Thank you guys. And thanks to Rick for joining me on this episode of the Haskin Cast podcast. Please remember to rate, review, share, whatever we can do to help get the word out. If you enjoyed the show, chances are somebody you know would enjoy it too. And if you didn't enjoy the show, maybe there's somebody that you know that would enjoy it too. Thank you guys very much. We'll see you next week for episode number 91. Cheers. Cheers.